Good morning and welcome to the City of Rapid City Planning Commission meeting for August 24th, 2017. If any member of the audience wishes to speak to an item on the Planning Commission agenda, there are speaker request forms on the table along the left wall. Please fill out the request with the agenda number of the item you wish to speak to and hand it to the staff seated on the left of the dais. At this time, we would also like to ask that if any member of the audience has a cell phone or other electronic device, that you either turn it off or turn the ringer to silent. If you need to take a call, please step out to the hallway so the meeting is not disrupted. Items one through five have been placed on the consent calendar and may be approved as a group. Action will be taken on all consent items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration at this time. The findings of this planning commission are recommendations to the city council. The city council will make the final decision with the exception of the following items. Item 5, 17 UR 016. The Rapid City Planning Commission's actions on this item is final unless any party appeals that decision to the Rapid City Council. All appeals must be submitted in writing to the Community Planning and Development Services Department by close of business on the seventh full calendar day following action by the Planning Commission. Are there any items one through five that staff would like removed? No, thank you. Are there any items one through five that the Planning Commission would like removed? Two. And are there any items that the audience would like removed? Steve made the motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item number two. Galen seconded that motion. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, excuse me, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item number two. <coughs> Rachel, did you have on item number two? Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I'm looking at this. Um, the rezoning request from low density, and maybe. Maybe I'm I'm lost here. If it's on the consent calendar, do we follow staff's recommendations? Um, what I have in front of me is a recommendation that this item be continued to September seventh. So if, if I left it on the consent calendar, we would have gone with that instead. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So that is the recommendation. Okay. And um, if you had a question about it being continued, we could discuss that. Um, I, I actually would like to continue it to the September 7th. That is our recommendation. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, then, um, I, for the sake of the minutes, I think it's just reflected that Rachel wanted to confirm that it was being continued to September 7th. Yes. And then you'll need to take action on that. Sounds good. Do we have a motion to continue to the 7th? We can continue to the 7th. Steve made the motion to continue this item to September 7th. Um, Mike seconded that motion. All those in favor of the continuation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number six, I'm going to have to step off uh, from this one due to involvement in this. Uh, so Karen will take over for item number six. Okay, item six is now open. Uh, Patsy, did you want to say anything? It's a continuation also, so? Nope. Okay. Applicants requesting it to be continued to the September 21st on okay. a commission meeting. So what is, okay, Steve made the motion and Galen seconded. Okay, motion to continue. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. All right, I'm back for item number seven. Item number seven is an initial and final plan development uh, to allow an athletic training center and performance center. It's uh, 17 PD 041. 
start the presentation. Uh, you, you'll be able to see the item on your screens before you, but uh, unfortunately it's not showing up on uh, the public screen, but let me go through the presentation. Property zoned office commercial district in July of this year, we saw a rezoning from general agriculture district to office commercial district in conjunction with a planned development designation, which is the reason bringing forward this initial and final plan development. Currently the property is void of structural development and it's located along uh, Mount Rushmore Road and Chapman Road. Future land use is employment center and Mount Rushmore Road is identified as an entrance corridor as well as a principal arterial street. Here we have a layout of the uh, proposed performance center. Uh, it's approximately 28,350 square feet inside and includes a gymnasium, office areas for physical training, wellness, sports medicine, and rehab injury prevention. Uh, the applicant is requesting one exception, which is to waive the requirement to provide landscape islands. That requirement would be three. They want it to go to zero. Uh, the justification for that is the robust landscaping that will be located along the Enchantment Road and around the perimeter of the uh, structure. Elevation of the proposed uh, structure showing some uh, signage on uh, the east elevation and west elevation. Here we have a view of the site itself with signposts on the property looking east along Enchantment Road uh, to the north uh, along Mount Rushmore Road to the north towards the intersection uh, church on the other side of Mount Rushmore Road. Uh, this is a Plains Vista Court. Uh, no access is, pro is proposed from this uh, secondary street. All access will be from Enchantment Road. Uh, looking to the south and looking along Enchantment Road back into the property towards uh, the west and Mount Rushmore Road. Uh, this is the one uh, dwelling which is located on that north side of Enchantment Road uh, towards where the second approach is and then looking east along Enchantment Road towards the 5th Street area and another view uh, at the neighboring properties. Uh, staff is recommending that the initial and final plan development be approved with stipulations noted in the staff report. Uh, are there any questions for staff? regarding this application. The uh, applicant's consultant is in the audience as well. Thanks, Fletcher. We do have a speaker request form on this. Uh, Mike, do you have a question for Fletcher, though? And maybe this isn't for Fletcher. Uh, I don't know exactly. We keep taking out the land the, in the parking lots. We keep taking out the request or to take out all the landscaping. And while I understand that completely, especially when you got snow removal, is it something that the city needs to visit um, for landscaping points and maybe we don't require those? And because it keeps coming up and we keep taking them out. And I only bring that up because it's official then. Um, but I think it's something we need to visit as we go forward. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Vicki. Um, Mike, that is really a good comment. Those of you who have looked at a mature parking lot that does have a landscape island in it and it's done correctly and maintained correctly, it does add a lot to the character of that uh, parking lot. It really breaks up the hardscape, which is the intent of a landscape island. Unfortunately, in our area where we do have some heavy snowfalls and maintenance of those islands become problematic, uh, it can interfere with just uh, the snow removal and then also the continued cost of having to replace that vegetation because of the salt that's then put onto that area. We did look at revamping our landscape ordinance here a few years ago. We worked on it for a very long time. Um, it wasn't well received. There was just a lot of controversy about it. What we have done then is stuck with the requirements at set forth and most of your building permits today that go through the city have those landscape islands. and. The uh, developers are doing a pretty good job maintaining that vegetation. 
when they come in with a plan development, we do openly discuss with them that if there could be improved vegetation along the perimeter, especially along streets, and then doing something that pops right at the entrance to the building, it has more of a aesthetic impact. And so we use this as our tool right now, but it is on our agenda be, to be uh, looking at our landscape ordinance again. So thank you, Mike, and we'll remember this comment when we address that issue. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, we'll go to Nancy Jensen, who has a request to speak on this item. Uh, well, I'm really, uh, I'm Nancy Jensen. I live in Rapid City. I live off of Plains Vista Court, the property that is right next to this. Um, I have a few issues with the whole thing, but um, I guess probably one of my biggest concerns is the main entrance coming into this. Um, looks like it's going to create some real bottlenecks because I'm still waiting to figure out how much traffic is coming in there. I see they passed the traffic report uh, for DOT. Um, I, we've, Enchanted Hills has been very concerned about traffic on Highway 16, and we don't have a turning lane there. We don't have a stoplight. We don't have an exit. And this is only going to compound some of the traffic in that area. The only thing I can see is possibly we could go down 16, uh, to the south and put up signing, DOT could maybe put up signing that there's an intersection coming up, please slow down because they're going 60 miles an hour down that street or down the highway 16 coming into Rapid. So that's one big concern. Uh, another one, uh, since this is way over my pay scale for what I'm qualified to know about this, uh, I'm somewhat concerned about how the retention ponds for water runoff is going to work. Uh, they have all those positioned at the uh, south end of the property, which runs on to Plains Vista Court. Plains Vista Court is a uh, gravel street. It's never been finished. Uh, I'm not quite sure how. I've seen on the drawing where they're going to put the retention ponds. And then they're going to do um, pipe where they have uh, holes running through the pipe going in, kind of like you would do a septic tank with a drain field scenario there. Um, I'm hoping that will be adequate for uh, the spot because uh, they plan to run that all along the gravel street there on, on Plains Vista Court. My understanding is they're going to have one down on the very far east and then some up on the other uh, north of Plains Vista, which then will run water into our gravel street. Uh, I'm sure they, the engineers know how this all works. I don't, but I'm concerned somewhat with uh, possible way too much water coming across Plains Vista Court at that point, but um, in a drought, that's not a problem. But in, when it gets wet, we do have one area out on that street right now that's always wet when we have any kind of a rainstorm, we get a puddle there. But uh, just little small things like that. Um, I'm a little concerned about uh, the sign of the signs. They, uh, the signing here again is a little uh, it'll be on the side of the building, I understand, on the east and the south side. Um, and they have 20 feet by 20 feet signs on their building, which seems pretty big, but um, I'm not in the sign business. Uh, the other thing is that uh, they, they plan to run this uh, operation as a... Uh, spectator, uh, coming, people coming into the gyms. They have their three gyms lined up there. And they're expecting to have, uh, which would generate traffic, spectators coming to their gymnasium, I assume to watch basketball uh, games, uh, whatever they have going on then in that complex, which um, 
I'm wondering what time of the day, I'm assuming this will be possibly late afternoon, uh, evening, into the evening, maybe they would be running these things. Um, oh, <laughs> just a few questions like that. Um, so I would like to know kind of what, what they plan to do there. Um, we did have our meeting uh, with, our, uh, with the uh, architect's office, and we had quite a few people there, and, and a lot of questions, of course, didn't get completely addressed, so I apologize for that. Uh, and so I would like a few more of my questions answered. I see they have uh, future plans for this property, and of course, we have our plan des development designation attached to the property, so we will get to find out about that in the future. I am extremely disappointed today that your video is not working, <laughs> but I guess that's uh, we'll sit in the dark. But uh, I, I'm wondering about the uh, the what they really are thinking that they would put in their future buildings coming up. Um, I guess that's it in my incoherent manner. I appreciate your listening to me. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you for the questions. We really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I might try to break them up and get some responses. Uh, your first one, the, can I put you on the spot, Ted, for um, questions regarding the traffic at that intersection? I assume since that's a highway, the DOT pretty much runs that show as far as evaluating the traffic thank you sir a uh, DOT has reviewed the plan has some comments we're still working through that our city engineering traffic engineers also looking at that trying to make sure that it all complies um, there is an existing driveway there it's a little hard to just eliminate that but we are working with the applicant and his architect to try to correct the issues as we can or plan for them in the future but I guess Donovan is in the audience as well. He can probably answer many of these questions better than I can. He's okay. Uh, the other question that came up was on stormwater runoff. Um, I have plans been submitted that have gone through your side on that that meet city standards? We've seen the plan development plans, which are more conceptual. Okay. We don't have all the hard facts. We haven't seen the construction plans. They aren't required at this time. They will be required to, to comply with the stormwater quality requirements as well as stormwater drainage. Um, maintain the drainage at historic levels, discharge at historic levels off-site. So we are looking at that. To say They've got conceptual plans, designs coming forward, but we haven't seen the final plans, but they will have to comply. Okay. And like I said, also defer to Donovan for any sure. or other information on that. Mr. Chair, yeah, they if I just might add, um, the details that will be required will come in as a part of the building permit. And so we do anticipate having full construction plans at that time. And as a part of that then, if there's anything that would require improvements to the access, uh, that would be looked at and required of the applicant to provide as well. So we do anticipate, similar to other plan developments, that uh, those details will come in, and there will be red line comments that will need to be addressed as a part of it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Donovan, would you have a few minutes? Or uh, The other concerns were sign size, uh, time of day events, and, and future plans. Uh, yep. Maybe on the sign size, just compare it to the size of the building. Uh, that's one thing that's hard to tell from a in the, overhead. In plan development, uh, we we lay out signs that are uh, profitable for the development within the signage uh, allowances per the ordinance. Uh, so if if we do show a a, a nice size uh, sign on the on the side of the building or the end of the building uh, for the Highway 16 exposure. Um, those signs are designed in, in kind of our final design and submittal, and they'll much, very likely be much smaller than that, but we want to get approved within the uh, allowances of the ordinance. So that's, that's, it's very typical of what we, what we do, so 
at this point we just show the area that we could uh, accommodate a sign. So, and I can address really all five of the things that were laid out if you want me to quick run through them. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, just to add that. some clarification, uh, a traffic study uh, report was, uh, we, we had a, hired a consultant, Interstate Engineering, out of Billings, Montana, to do that traffic study, and there we, we have that recommendations on file. We've submitted that as part of the plan development, and uh, that uh, showed that there, uh, at this time, there's no improvements required of the intersection, Highway 16 and Enchantment. Um, certainly the owner is looking forward to seeing that be a, a safe and improved uh, intersection at, at some point too, but it's not required of the with the development at this phase at this time. Um, in regards to to drainage, uh, of course, uh, as Ted was saying, we need to maintain historical flows across there. the 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 property uh, is fairly flat, but it uh, it flow it, it slopes about eight feet from the north to the to the south. So that is the natural drainage paths, um, and uh, we do have a retention pan, uh, pond that is very long and extended uh, along the south edge that we've worked into the design to capture uh, flows from the impervious paving and, and, and roof areas, and so that is accommodating that, and of course that's designed to outflow at the historic rates. Um, into that right of way to the south. Um, I guess uh, fourth question, there was some mention uh, by Mrs. Jensen about spectators and uh, that would be one of the uses. Uh, most of the time it's a, it's a training facility but they may, uh, would obviously lead to actual uh, games and small tournaments. We have Really, the, the actual worst case scenario of the parking is based off of of that scenario. Um, so that that's one of the formulas we use to establish uh, the high end of the parking. And uh, as far as uh, actual hours of operation and such, I can't predict when those types of uses would be versus training and other types of uses. Um, except that it's fairly common business hours and, and such. Uh, uh, future uh, potential buildings uh, and structures on the site were shown as placeholders for showing the potential to the developer for the long-term future as he invested in the property of what things he could, uh, he could possibly do, but there isn't any uh, commitment to those at, at this time so and we've shown uh, associated expansion of parking areas as such uh, to accommodate both structures and parking and and other things but those any such things would be major amendments to this PCD in the long-term future we did have a, uh, a neighborhood meeting on Monday evening uh, and had uh, I think about 15 people from the neighborhood showed up at our office and uh, as far as I know we uh, people left without any questions so we, we, we really spent about an hour and a half uh, carefully walking through things with them and uh, I, I enjoyed the meeting and as a follow-up to that uh, uh, that meeting was Monday at 4, uh, Tuesday at 4 o'clock. We had another couple come in, thought the meeting was that day, and uh, we spent about 20 minutes walking through it with them. And, uh, and then, just because it's a nice theme, Wednesday at 4 o'clock, we had another couple come in. And <laughs> so there was maybe some confusion from the information being passed around as to when the meeting was, but... Uh, we might have seen about 20 people from the neighborhood and uh, they did all leave what I understood with being able to um, understand what we were doing and, and uh, so we, we were glad we had that opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the commission?
Karen? Thank you. I think this probably is for Fletcher or somebody from the staff. Um, in something I read, and I don't know if it was something from um, ARC International or where I saw it, I think it was there though, that said something about uh, they were trying to get an exception for the screening on the east side of the building, but I didn't see anything that required that. So I'm just curious to know what that That was, was part of the original application was a request to waiver screening requirement along the east property line because it was next to general ag, but because it's not a residential district, we told them to remove that uh, exception request. So that should have been updated. The new letter of intent put in with the uh, revisions to wait, get rid of that request, which we would have supported because it was only about a 10 foot wide fence that was gonna be needed and wouldn't have done anything anyway. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I think a lot of the questions that, that Nancy may have and, and the neighbors really will come when they do the actual uh, plan development and show everybody what's going to happen out there and and they'll have better information I would guess that sound right am I, am I thinking right no this is an initial and final so this, this is the initial the, and final so when will they find out then at the building permit stage as far as the drainage and yes and that, that that staff will review that okay. uh, at that time okay one further question then about the traffic in the future, if, if traffic does become an issue, how does that get resolved? Mr. Chair? Yeah, Vicki. So as we look at the traffic impact study and um, from what uh, I've been informed of this morning that the traffic engineer had anticipated that with the anticipated growth of this area based on existing zoning and the background traffic that's there today, that it would be about 2023 before there would need to be some type of improvement at that intersection. If something should happen in the meantime and there should become issues, that's certainly something the city will visit with the state. And because that is a state highway, um, they will be a key player as to what that improvement would look like. But there is an opportunity for the public to contact the city and the state as they see issues arise. And then we can deal with them uh, if necessary. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I, I know that that's an issue where I live because people come down that street really fast and trying to turn, and I, I've always wanted a turning lane. And so I think in Shannon Hills area, they probably could use a turning lane also, but I understand the issues, so thank you. Further questions, comments from the commission? Seeing none, I guess I'd look for a motion. Commissioner Sullivan? Okay. Commissioner Sullivan. Commissioner Sullivan made the motion to Second. approve with stipulations. Uh, Steve seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number eight. Item number eight is 17 PD042. It's a major amendment to a plan development to allow a microbrewery. Uh, in particular, the applicant is proposing to open Zimmercracy Beer Company, a three barrel production brewery. It'll have a suite of 2,795 square feet in size, 1,000 square foot tasting room, and a 200 square foot outdoor patio area. Uh, property is zone general commercial district and a plan development. The original plan development approved a uh, commercial structure with approximately six suites. Uh, this major amendment is required because the microbrewery and the associated on sale liquor use would be a conditional use in the general commercial district. Uh, the building is currently up. They're finishing up. Looks like some landscaping, but and they're building the, almost the exact same building which we reviewed in another plan development on that property to the south. Uh, future land use is, I believe, light or heavy industrial and along an entrance corridor. And Elkvale Road is identified as a principal arterial street. Here we have a layout of the uh, building identifying the suite 
and the layout of that microbrewery and tasting area. Uh, site plan showing the building and access and parking. Parking is in compliance as is landscaping. Uh, elevations showing the proposed or the building as it exists. And we'll get to that. Sign is posted on the property. Uh, looking along Elkville Road to the north and the east to the intersection uh, out towards the uh, north. Uh, along the west, along Elkvale, uh, back along Creek Drive, and across the street to the west. Uh, there is a residential development, but it's approximately 1,600 feet to the northeast. Uh, this shouldn't have a uh, negative impact on that. Brings uh, mixed use, uh, additional mixed use to this area and the uh, development as it's happening, uh, promoting the development. And staff is recommending that the uh, major amendment to the plan development be approved with stipulations noted in the staff report. Are there any questions for staff? And the applicant is in the audience if there are any questions for the applicant. Thanks, Fletcher. Uh, Commissioner Rollinger made the motion to approve with stipulations. Karen seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine. Item number nine is 17RZ025, a rezoning request from Park Forest District to Low Density Residential District for a property approximately 9.85 acres in size. Uh, here we have the proposed proper, or the property. You can see it's the only property zoned Park Forest District in this area, and it's uh, a steep shale hill. Uh, surrounding properties are low-density residential district, and then we've got a middle school in that blue to the north. Currently, the property is void of structural development, and anyone who's, who's lived in Rapid City for very long probably has some stories about this hill. Uh, future land use shows it as forest conservation. The reason for that is that no one's been able to bring forward uh, information that would show that this could be developed as a low density neighborhood. Um, the applicant has submitted a preliminary layout plan and has submitted inf infrastructure information to Public Works uh, showing the feasibility of putting single family dwellings on this piece of property and subdividing it. Uh, but the applicant should be aware that bringing in a preliminary subdivision plan in the future and platting will require uh, a lot more information and detail regarding drainage, uh, soil stability, erosion control, and th that would all be covered in the future. Uh, but staff is recommending that in addition to having that information reviewed in the future that the rezoning be approved with a plan development designation. You, you, you can see that we have a, a petition linked as well as some handouts that are up on the uh, dais before you. Uh, showing voicing some concerns regarding the proposed rezone and so the plan development designation will ensure that before this is developed in the future that a final plan development comes before the planning commission for review and approval and that the neighborhood is once again notified of uh, what is coming forward uh, here's that proposed or not proposed but preliminary layout which was uh, Shows 14 lots, however, after speaking with the uh, applicant's consultant, it would appear that it's going to be much less than that because of the costs of, of developing in that area. Uh, here we have looking from Indiana Street south into the property, and you can see uh, the hillside that it is, and that is where access would be proposed is from uh, Indiana Street and that's a right-of-way which is uh, provides access to that property uh, looking west along Indiana Street the school uh, across the street to the north and looking to the east uh, the rezoning sign is posted up on uh, I believe that's Grandview and so we're looking at the views from up there and you can see that this would be a desirable property to uh, develop with the views that there are up there 
Uh, however, you know, it would appear that in the past, people haven't been able to, developers haven't been able to show that it could be developed. And that's looking uh, south along Grandview and their existing single family dwellings. So uh, staff's recommendation is to approve the rezoning in conjunction with the plan development designation. I believe there are some speaker request forms uh, before you, are there any questions for staff at this time? Mike? Uh, Fletcher, when you say that uh, they haven't been able to show in the past, I'm assuming it's because of the soil conditions and so forth in that area. I, I, I wouldn't think that we left that there for the deer to cohabitate, but... Um, I believe it's because of the extension of, of utilities as well as building and then the, the shale which the hillside is made out of. So no one has been able to bring forward information to show that it could be developed. However, the uh, applicant's consultant has been working with public works staff and has brought forward preliminary information that, that shows that they could potentially develop it. Uh, but a lot of that information is going to come forward with the preliminary subdivision plan. So the neighborhood should know that uh, there will be a lot of work done before they determine whether this is um, good or bad, whether the soil is a problem. So they'll, they'll know in advance. Well, I think the this, this shale is a problem. It's, it's the applicant has to bring in that information to show how they're going to deal with drainage and the soil stability and erosion control. Sure. And that's something that will come forward with a preliminary subdivision plan. Mr. Chair, yeah, thank you. so this application came in as a rezoning request and you've seen many of them and typically we put up a picture that says here's the area and they request the rezone and that's all you usually get. Uh, knowing that this was a tough site, the applicant was wise to hire a consultant that said we need to demonstrate to the city, the neighbors and of course you folks, that if these densities are projected uh, how are they going to address the issues for residential development? That leads to access, utilities, drainage, and of course we all know this area has got shale. Those that live in the area have probably experienced some issues with their home sites because of that same soil. So they did bring that information in beyond what was typically seen as a part of what you would be looking at today. In fact, the application that you have before you is similar to what you would see with an initial plan development. But as they've looked at it, uh, my understanding is that it's been determined that there are limitations and that the uh, 14 home sites that they thought might work may be more than will actually work. Um, our proposal to approve this only as a part of a plan development will require that they bring in a final plan development to you folks and to show to the neighborhood that will more specifically address how those issues are going to be accommodated so that it doesn't negatively impact that neighborhood. So therefore our recommendation today is that the rezone going forward should be only with the plan development designation. Thank you. Uh, Galen. Thank you. I, I think you answered my question. I, I was going to ask, can you reiterate what the city's recommendation is? That is to approve this with a plan development, um, but I guess my concern is if it, if we do that, and then let's say the developer decides that they can't do this project, then it would still sit in low density residential and they'd have to do a rezone to flip it back to Park Forest if the project couldn't work for some reason. So if we approve this and it will sit in low density with that plan development, correct? The fact that you, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the it. fact that it is, uh, if, if it is approved with a plan development designation, then independent of the underlying zoning, nothing can happen on that property until Planning Commission approves a final PD. So the density, shale, drainage, et cetera, would be addressed. And I think it's those issues that are really going to identify the density that is appropriate for this area. They wouldn't have to rezone it back to Park Forest if they do, didn't do anything they would have to get a final plan development before they could do anything. Would, I mean, does it hurt them to keep it as 
low density resident, and again, I'm thinking hypotheticals here, but is there like a difference in tax brackets or anything like that if it's low density residential versus park forest or does it restrict them in any way to? So my understanding from the director of equalization's office is this would be a residential property um, that would be appropriate for development and it'll be a tax according to its use today. I don't know that they look at our underlying zoning. They've identified it a zoning of their own that's separate from ours. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Kwasny. With that said, I think those are great questions. Is there a way to have a stipulation that if this does not work, that it goes back? Can that be done? Mr. Chair, no. Once it's been rezoned, then the, uh, the assurance that you have that it will stay as is, is knowing that before they can get a building permit, Planning Commission has to approve a fa final plan development, independent of the underlying zoning. And we'd have to make some sort of move at this body to rezone it, right? There, we, I don't think there's a, an avenue for it Correct. zoning to change without public action, right? Correct. It would have to follow the procedure set forward by the state uh, and as also by our ordinance. Galen? Sorry, one, other, one more quick comment before maybe we go into some other people like to hear from the public here, but, you know, this seems like a property that's been used by the neighborhood as more or less as a park, even though it's privately owned. So is this a candidate for something that the city could purchase and, and create a public, an actual public space? And that's probably a question for council or, or somebody else, but that's just an idea that I had is we've got these infill developments that would probably function better as a public space. So why don't, you know, if there's a way to work out agree agreements for the city to actually purchase them and make them officially public spaces, I think that'd be a, the best use of this property. But um, and again, it is private property and the developer is allowed to do with it as our ordinances say. Mr. Chair, yeah, we do route these requests to the Parks and Recreation Department and there was no indication from them that there was the availability to, um, to, to proceed with something along those lines. Um, See so another you know, uh, request from up here. Uh, I think we should go to the uh, speaker request from the audience. Uh, just a quick note: we, as you come and speak, try not to repeat the same items that previous speakers have. Um, we try to listen very well, at, but past that, please tell us what's on your mind. Um, we'll start with Pat Muldoon. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions that I am concerned about. I have, I'm a resident on East Indiana. Um, we've had several problems already with the hill sliding into our property. Um, a lot of damage done to cement and so on. Um, I was the one that instigated the petition for to get it this stopped. Um, every sidewalk, with exception of about three that were brand new, has cracks. The sidewalk's not level, it's up and down. Um, the biggest thing that I have a concern about is in 1946, October 1st, Hillcrest, half of Hillcrest slid down into Central High School because of the fact that it was shale. I don't wanna see homes being built above me and have them slide into my property. I think that it's just to leave it the way it is. You know, we're suffering some damage, but nothing major. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing when you go back into history and see the things that the city has done and wonder why, and then something falls through. And this is one thing that I definitely feel that the city should not approve. Let's leave it the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doug, Dane, Don, I apologize if I 
dang, I ah, should have went with my original thought. I'm sorry. Good morning. My name is Doug Daney. I live at 119 East Indiana. I'm directly across from South Middle School. Um, yeah, I also strongly oppose this. Um, as stated, there's the, the shale is extremely unstable. Um, I have lived there for mm, around 30 years in the same house. And um, like my garage floor, for instance, uh, when I first moved in there, I had ha hairline cracks. And now I have cracks <clears throat> probably, uh, you know, two, two and a half inches wide. Um, certain times of the year, doors will open and close, or I should say be able to shut the door. Depends on whether it's wet or dry. Um, so there's, you know, there, there is major problems with that shale. And uh, I would like to see the city not, you know, go ahead with, with that deal. Um, I guess that's probably about all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Boyle. I, I'll just decline right now because these people have been here longer than I have. And I live across the street. I don't Could you talk to the mic? You might as well just say it in the microphone. Thank no. you. <laughs> okay. Um, Linda Boyle and I live at 2603 Oak, Oak Drive which is across the street from my neighbors that live right on that hill. And I have a lot of problems in my yard, too. The, the ground in that area is, is pretty scary at times. And like he said, some, the, the ground just cracks. It looks like an earthquake in there with all the little... And with that hill over there being shale and everything, I think these people have a lot more to, I'm, I'm more in support of these people because they have more to worry about than I do. So that's really basically why I'm here and supporting them and because I, I know what can happen if, uh, if this is approved, it, it can create a lot of problems for a lot of people around that hill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin? <laughs> Obstacle. <laughs> I didn't even want to try it. Uh, I basically can, don't... I'm sorry, can you just name an address for uh, records? Uh, Robin Obstadal, I live at 2610 Oak Drive, and it's in the section, the little section on your map there. Um, I live at the bottom of the hill and on that little piece there, um, it's very steep behind my house and I have the same problems that they're talking about, they've been talking about our house. I've lived there for 35 years and uh, my husband's kidded for years that we were going to end up down on Oak Avenue because of the settling and the movement of that hill and I'm really concerned that when they dig it up that it's going to uh, cause a lot of problems with the earth and I just hope that you know they do an environmental impact study because I don't think I think there's a reason that it hasn't been developed for 50 years my house was built in 1958 so I'm just here to uh, oppose the rezoning thank you thank you Holly Kaufman Hi, Holly Kaufman, 2514 Grandview Drive. We live at the top, um, the dead end of Grandview. And when I came home and saw the rezoning, I thought, not, not a big deal. They probably got great plans until I saw the plans. And my immediate thought is this is going to damage the structural integrity of our house. Anytime we've had a drought, anytime there's a lot of rain, no rain, there's cracks shifting, our doors open, they don't open, um, readjusting locks, you name it. And when we talked to people, they said it's because of the hill, it's because of the, the ground, the slate. Looking at the plans, I think if there weren't houses below and there weren't houses above, check it out. You know, see if it does any harm. Put, put your houses there. 
but there's houses below and there's houses above that I, I don't think you can even begin a project like this and begin to see what kind of damage it does. And I, I fear that by rezoning, it becomes the death of a thousand cuts. You, you start by saying, uh, go ahead, we'll rezone it, but we won't approve any, any plans yet. But I just, I feel like it just needs to be left the way it is. The structural integrity of our homes is already compromised, just living on the hill. Any plans, either now or in the future, when I have grandkids that hopefully come up and visit, uh, I don't want it to be any worse than it is. So we're asking you to just leave it as is. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last of my speaker requests. Rachel? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it is really important, you know, as Galen was saying, that this, is, um, this appears to be a big part of the neighborhood. And, and it really makes me sad to kind of take something, you know, but at the same time, there is a private ownership here that we need to be aware of. But um, there was, there was a lot of talk about how, you know, disconcerting the shale soil is. Um, I think probably engineering techniques now are a lot different than they were in 1946. Uh, but my concern with that is that you're going to have to do, and speaking <clears throat> not as a professional, but just as a citizen, you know, uh, my concern is that um, that the amount of money that the developer is going to have to put into fixing the soil conditions will make the few houses cost prohibitive, and you'll have something that's sort of dead in the water because no one's going to be able to afford to buy those houses in that neighborhood. Um, and, and so I don't think that rezoning is wise. You know, I would hope that the owner finds another way to use this property without, you know, doing something that, I, I don't know. I, I've got concerns about how much it's going to cost and, and what effect that's going to have on the neighborhood, having, you know, houses that nobody will buy just because of how much those houses will cost. But anyway, that's my only comment. Thanks, Rachel. Vicki? Just so that uh, everyone is aware, the property is currently zoned residential. It's part forest, which goes to density, but it's still residential. Uh, the owner of the property could come in and submit a plat to subdivide, creating um, a maximum of three lots. They could build a street, and they could put three homes up there, and that would not require uh, public notice or um, the involvement of the neighborhood. The intent that they are proposing to rezone it to increase those densities is what opens up the discussion that we're having today. And certainly, whether it's one home or 14 homes, the review the city will give this project is the same. We'll be looking for that uh, integrity with the soil stability, erosion and sediment, access and utilities regardless of the density, but just so the neighborhood is aware, it is currently zoned to support three homes. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Mike Kwasny. And I think it's important that the neighbors understand that sometimes as a planning commission, we don't have, uh, while we may completely agree that this, the shale is a problem and that there are some things they have the right to build on that and somebody could put something on there no matter what we determine because of the way it's zoned right now so um, while we might agree with the people in that area and agree with, with the problems that are there um, I think the proper steps will be taken to make sure that it's safe as safe as it can be in any neighborhood thanks Mike Steve Rollinger well, I'm assuming, <clears throat> based on what Vicki said, the reason they're coming forward is that it, it, building three homes up there probably wouldn't pencil out. And so the only way to make this viable for them would be to change it and to add more homes up there. Otherwise, those three will probably never be built realistically because of the cost and the problem they're having up, up there. So I think what they're saying is they'd rather not have the the, the change because most likely it's going to stay the same as and what we need to decide as a, as a planning commission if we go ahead and do the rezone then we're basically saying we're giving them the opportunity basically to add more structures up up there and maybe make this a, a viable thing 
So I guess uh, you know that's something we have to consider here is, is by making this change, you're, you're probably gonna cause something to happen there. Karen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think all of us would like to have the opportunity to say, um, you know, we don't want that, that hillside to, to change. We want it to keep it the same as it is. If you look at it from a citizen standpoint, everybody would like to have a nice place in their backyard that, although the shale is bad, at least is not being tampered with. And I, I, I've been in several situations that are similar, and even in my neighborhood, I didn't want to see any development there, not for the same reason, but for other reasons. And, and sometimes you just have to say, um, I think I think something has to be done. Either the city's got to purchase that property or the neighborhood has to get together and purchase that property for it to remain the same. And and the person that owns this, it's private property. He does have the right to build, as Vicki mentioned. Uh, and I agree with Steve, it's just probably hard to pencil out to put in three homes. Um, so I think the, the question really is, should we allow him to at least go forward to see if he can do this? And maybe he'll get to the point and say, I, I still can't make this work. I think the instability of the soil is the biggest issue up there. And I know places have been built on shale before. It's just how they, how they do it and how it's done correctly. So um, I think of all the properties that we have to rezone, this is the perfect one to have a plan development designation on it because we do want to see more. We want, we want the neighbors to see what's going to happen up there. And, and I think that's the proper way to do this if you're going to rezone it. So it's, it's a difficult decision, and I, and I haven't totally made up my mind yet, but um, I'll listen to some more discussion, I guess. Kurt? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know the history of, you know, the person who bought this property, if they've had it uh, since it was zoned Park Forest, or if somebody bought it with the intention, yeah, I can get that zoning changed, and and make it denser. Uh, I just think that um, it was zoned park forest for a reason. Um, the future land use plan calls it urban forest conservatory or something like that. Um, I think the intention when the property owners, you know, even if they were there prior to the zoning or even after the zoning, bought their lots because, hey, here's a park, some stuff zoned park forest. I can see that I've got a good opportunity to have a park in my backyard, so to speak, even though it can be developed into three, three lots. Um, I'm not in favor of this rezone because, because of that, that it, just, just because somebody can rezone something doesn't mean that's the right thing to do. Um, I, I, I've heard, you know, been in the development business before and, and, and hearing people come in and say, well, you know, I, I love having this vacant lot in my backyard. Um, I didn't think anybody was going to develop there. Well, maybe it was zoned general commercial or, or higher density residential or whatever. If, if you don't want something built there and it's zoned where somebody could build there, then, then maybe you need to buy the property. Um, I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles here, but I, I just think that that uh, it being zoned uh, park forest now, I, I don't see a need to change that. Um, and that's my opinion, and I'll be voting no on this. Thanks, Kurt. John? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I hope the Planning Commission doesn't mind if I chime in on a few things. Uh, this is mostly my opinion and not an opinion of the City Council. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been brought up is, is the city purchasing this property. Um, unfortunately, if we purchased every property that citizens wanted us to purchase, we would own about half a Rapid City. <laughs> and, you know, there are times that we do and we have in the past purchased property. Um, there's e either been flood issues or it's been something we could work into our major park system. This property probably doesn't fall within that. And as 
the city, we would have to pay whatever the assessed value on this property may or may not be, depending on what kind of development can come on this property. Um, you know, unfortunately, I hope and I feel for the residents of the area, but I hope this commission doesn't deny this, um, but, it, but really it doesn't matter. It'll probably come back to this to the council anyway and we'll get a chance to talk on, the, on this. But I think that the owner of the property, as a property owner, we all have property rights, has the, should have the ability to look into the property to see what can be done on it. It's gonna be driven by the cost of infrastructure on this property. And as a realtor and as a builder, I know what those costs are. And I see this being very problematic because of the soil conditions. But one thing that I think this commission should realize too is 80 plus percent of the developable land east of Dinosaur Hill is shale. We build on shale constantly in one degree or another. And in some areas, it's awful, and it's, it's worse than others, but those building practices over the last 20 years have tr changed tremendously, tremendously. And I really look at this, you know, not only as a council person, but, but as, as someone who's, who's doing business in Rapid City and, and Pennington County and Meade County, I look at this as being fairly problematic because of the cost of it. Um, you know, 12 lots and you're looking at your infrastructure costs, but not only the infrastructure costs, the cost of that grade of that hill going up there, which putting your roads in is going to increase your cost of there. Having to mitigate that shale with, you know, having to dig out, add, add gravel, add engineered soil. I mean, there's a lot of costs in here, and I would like to see, personally, I'd like to see what kind of plan they come up with and what the costs of these are. But I think that it's important to give somebody on private property that opportunity and our city staff especially, if we see issues with that, we're not going to allow it. Um, you know, if something drastic did happen, let's hope nothing would, but you know, we can't look into the future. We can only look at what can be done now, what possibly can be done now and what is this property owner's, you know, what, what should they be allowed? I guess that's what I'm looking at here. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. Mike? Uh, and maybe this is a question for Fletcher or Vicki, um, or it might even be a question for the engineering. If this goes through, or if we deny this, they still have the right to do the three homes or, or whatever it is, they will still have the same requirements as far as making sure that the soil and all the things are, it's just restricting the number of residents they can put on the hillside. Mr. Chair, yeah, you. as I mentioned before, Park Forest and Low Density Residential are residential zoning districts. So both of those districts would allow a single family residence. The difference is density. Park Forest requires a minimum uh, three acre lot size and low density residential would require 6,500 square feet lot size if, again, access, utilities, uh, soil stability, et cetera, was addressed. And not knowing what that number should be, staff recommended that we put it in a plan development so that you and the neighborhood would have that detailed information to see what that difference wa would be, noting that even though the comprehensive plan does show it as forest conservation, it was identified that it was being held in that designation until it could be demonstrated that the drainage and soil stability and access was being addressed. And so this applicant was proposing to do that in this application and, and here at some point, Mr. Chair, maybe I can go over your options of, for motions and we can go uh, into what, how you might get some more information before final action. But uh, ultimately, yes, we would get that same level of information, whether they were getting a building permit for one home or 14. 
the land was purchased with the understanding of what it's zoned right now though, right? So he purchased the land knowing that it was limited on what he could put in there. Now we want to take an additional, take the chance with additional homes. So he already knew what he was purchasing. And I guess that's what I, to the neighborhood, and I understand what we're saying that he could take and do all of his tests and stuff, but he, I, I want to not go with, he purchased the land with the understanding that it was limited residential. And so don't get stuck on the fact that he has the rights to do whatever he wants. Uh, I think that's our, as a planning commission, we need to think about that also. Thanks, Mike. One follow-up question just regarding, and this is probably split um, between Ted and you, Vicki, but from a planning perspective, um, did we're at the point now where we require soils testing for every house built, are we not? Did that come through? Every yes. lot. And same with a uh, public street, right? If, if the city's going to take a street, whoever constructs it has to test the soil before in, and build the street per the soils report, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. There's some minimum requirements, minimum spacing, minimum number of tests and such for okay. any public infrastructure and utilities or streets, as well as the city building code okay. requirements for the foundation design and testing on the okay. lot per lot basis. All right, thank you. Uh, I see no other lights up currently. Uh, there further comment on this item? Uh, Steve. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> really struggling in this one because I'm usually pro-economic development and pro-building, but uh, you know, listening to what Mike said, I, I kind of agree. When you bought the land, you knew you had restrictions on it, but you also know there's, there's ways that you can move forward, and that's what he's doing today. He's coming to us and saying, you know, if I can do this, I might be able to make this Pencil out the way it says now, and the reason that it's not being built, and like I said earlier, is the fact that it doesn't pencil out. You can't take three houses and put them up there unless you're going to bring some multi billionaires in to have money to throw down the toilet. So, if we deny this, then, then we're basically denying him the ability to go forward and maybe make something out of that. So, I'm in that struggle where you know I think that he probably has a right to at least look at it, you know, what John said is that, hey, you know, give them the opportunity because it's been sitting there empty. Nobody's done anything. It's not been turned into the park. The neighborhood hasn't purchased it. And it goes back to that old saying, if you've got a view there, you, you don't own a view unless you buy it. And so it's his property, so I'm still struggling with this one. <laughs> Karen? Thank you. <clears throat> this is a, a difficult issue that we've, we're looking at, I guess. Um, I don't know when this person bought this property, so it, you know, to me, it, he could have bought it several years ago. And so, you know, at the time, when you look at the property from just looking at it, not looking at the soils, just looking at it, what a beautiful spot! I mean, you're at the top of that hill; you can see. I mean, it would make a great place for, to have some homes up there. And even if he knew it was part forest, putting three homes up there sounds like a wonderful idea. And, and once you get into the nitty gritty of it and trying to figure out how it's gonna work and realize that you're gonna lose money if you put houses up there, I can understand why he would want to have this rezoned. And um, I don't know, I know you mentioned that he came in and, or somebody came in from the developer or his, his agent and said that apparently 14 homes is gonna be too many. I don't know if he's said how many less he's going to have or he just said less yeah oh, okay um so either he has to put in some really expensive homes up there to sell to make it pencil out or he's going to have to put a few more homes up there to do this and if we don't allow him the opportunity to at least try what's he going to do with that piece of property it's just going to sit there and it, if i was him and i couldn't do anything with my property I'd probably let it go back to the county or something. It's not pay my taxes on it. Or I don't know what you do with it. Um, 
so I guess, as Steve said, this is a dilemma. We have to decide if, if we should at least give him the opportunity or, or we should just listen to our feelings and say, gee, this is not a good place to put house and, and so we're going to deny it. So I guess that's the dilemma we're in and we just have to make a decision one way or the other. So that's my comment. Rachel? Um, yeah, I have a question for Steph. Uh, Vicki, you stated that you had um, some ideas for moving forward for the uh, Planning Commission, and I'm just curious about those. So my suggestion would be that if, if you're looking at making a motion, that we just go through what those motions might be. You could recommend to approve it with a plan development designation as proposed by staff, noting that full plans would have to come in before as a part of a final plan development before they could get a building permit. Uh, you could recommend to deny it, uh, which you would need to cite um, specific uh, criteria for why it would be denied. And we do spell those out in the project report. Uh, as an example, you may want to identify that um, due to adverse impacts onto the neighborhood that this is the reason why you're denying it. Uh, another option might be to continue this and to direct the applicant to come back uh, with a final plan development to be considered at the same time as the rezone so that we see what those densities would look like and what that soil stability access and utility design um, would be designed to accommodate some of the concerns that you voiced today. So approve with PD, deny, or continue it. And then you probably have to continue it for probably about a month because they're going to need a little time to bring that information in. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Steve? So, Vicki, if we um, deny it, does it still go on to council? Absolutely. And, I, and you know, with the struggle I'm having, and I hear other people here, I, I like option three that you had there that, I, that, that yeah, that we do the um, continuation and give it about a month. So I, that would be my motion. Mr. Chair, if we could, I, I need to ask Carla a question. Yeah. Um, Carla, if they continue this today, let's say for a month, and the applicant, who unfortunately isn't here today, if that is not working with his schedule, could he approach the council at their next meeting and ask them for, an, for them to take an action different than that? Since is Planning Commission's continuation sending it forward for council to act on it? I think Planning Commission could continue it for a month and it wouldn't go before the City Council. It would come back before the Planning Commission okay. under your timeline. It's only when the Planning Commission takes final action on something that it goes forward to council. We would just... So Steve made the motion to continue this item for a month with the stipulation that they come back, it comes back with a plan development application, is Correct. that? So we need to be specific to what date you're continuing it to, and thank you, Fletcher, for bringing me the submittal calendar. Um, it looks like you would have to continue it to your October 5th Planning Commission meeting to give them enough time to submit an application, staff to review it, and bring forward a project report. Okay. That'd be my motion. I'm sorry, I blanked there. What was the date? October 5th. The, October 5th. All right, and Mike Kwasney seconded that motion. All sounds good to you as well? Okay. Uh, further discussion on that motion to continue to October 5th? Commissioner Sullivan? Thank you. Karen? Mr. I, I, I think this is a, a correct motion. It gives the, the neighborhood an opportunity to see what's actually going to go in there. It gives us a better idea of whether this is really going to work or not, especially with the soil stuff. And, and it could be that the, the applicant says, I'm, I don't want to put that kind of money in it. 
you know, depending on, on uh, you know, what he wants to do uh, before we even say yes or no. So it, it might come back to him and he might not want to do this, but I think it's the appropriate thing to do so we have a better understanding what could be out there. So I'm going to support it. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Vicki. Uh, Gerald actually makes a good point. If it's your desire to just see this denied and we continue this out to October 5th so they can submit a final plan development, there's a lot of cost associated with bringing forward all that information. And if they do demonstrate that they can address those issues, then um, you know they're going to be coming, look, coming forward with the assumption that since they've done that, that they would get the uh, approval from the Planning Commission. So I just challenge all of you to, to think if that is the case, could you support this or are you going to uh, be against this regardless of what the outcome is? Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Mike Quasney. With that said, though, I, I think that if we determine from the what he's studied and we don't think that it's appropriate, I don't think that puts us in the position where we have to say yes. I, I, I would hold that we don't have to say yes whether he spent the money or not. So um, we have that, that's just a chance to get more information and, and decide, make a better decision. Thanks, Mike. Further discussion on the motion to continue to October 5th? Steve? I, I disagree with, with, you know, with Vicki. I don't think some of us up here have made up our mind. That's the whole point of doing this. I know I have, and I'm, I'm struggling with this, and that's why I'd rather see it do that. So I, I want to continue with the motion. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Any others? Um, seeing no other comments, we'll proceed with a vote. All those in favor of the motion to continue this to October 5th with the uh, stipulation that it comes back with a final plan development uh, application as well, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Probably should roll call that. Quasney? Hughes? No. Gallagher? No. Aye. Rollinger? Aye. Braun? No. Bullman? Aye. Sullivan? No. Okay, motion carries six to three. Item number 10. Item number 10 is 17UR017, a conditional use permit to allow a sexually oriented business in the general commercial district. The property is located at 1141 Deadwood Avenue and is proposed for suite seven. Not sure I got that right, yes. Uh, takes through some slides. Properties on general commercial district. It's located within a established industrial commercial corridor located along Deadwood Avenue. Uh, properties developed with a strip mall. Uh, the other uh, property or businesses located in that strip mall, it's called the Deadwood Avenue Business Park. It's Safe Light Auto Glass, Bad Cat Tattoo, Rare Finds Decor, Riley Salon Supply, and Merry Maids. Uh, the applicant is Dick and Jane's Naughty Spot, and uh, there are criteria for review for a uh, adult oriented business or sexually oriented business uh, in the city uh, that cannot be within a thousand feet of a religious building, public or private school, child care facility, residential districts, the central business district, public parks or recreational areas, auditoriums, convention centers, fairgrounds, museums, art or music centers, and theaters, and that's just a, a short list of it. Uh, the property is in compliance with those requirements. Uh, in addition, the applicant is proposing to be in compliance with all the other requirements of uh, Chapter 1750-186 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, which governs what is allowed 
for a sexually oriented business. Um, staff is recommending that the conditional use permit be approved with the stipulations noted in the staff report, but let me go through the other slides for you. Uh, Deadwood Avenue is identified as an entrance corridor, uh, light industrial, future land use, and uh, Deadwood Avenue is identified as a principal arterial street. Here we have just a layout of the suite uh, located in the building. Uh, site plan showing uh, what is existing on the property. And I believe this suite is located on this northern side. Uh, some photos submitted by the applicant. Uh, garages on that west side of the property. Uh, this is a picture of the proposed suite and the conditional use permit sign in the window located on the property looking at uh, the rest of the businesses which are in this same strip mall and the signage. Looking across the street we've got uh, I believe it's a con contractor's yard building and uh, the auto repair looking along Deadwood Avenue to, uh, towards downtown and the city. Uh, there's warehousing packaging company located adjacent to the property uh, and then this is looking north along Deadwood Avenue uh, you did you do have a uh, handout uh, of opposition to the uh, conditional use permit by one of the neighbors however as I stated this meets all the requirements of the Rapid City Municipal Code and the Zoning Ordinance for location of a sexually oriented business. Um, and I would like to note that the letter names uh, Renner and Associates as the applicant. However, they are not the applicant. They are the consultant for the applicant. The applicant is Dick and Jane's Naughty Spot, not Renner Associates. So are there any questions for staff at this time? Thanks, Fletcher. Uh, Steve? I don't have any questions for staff, but I was looking at, at the letter I got here from Black Hills Corporation, and basically they cite three reasons that you know they're up. Um, it, it goes against their core values and their and so the business opposed to it. It also says that it would create a negative impression for Black Hills Energy vendors and etc., and it would adversely impact the uh, property values. And what I think they need to understand is a planning commission. We can't look at core issues or values or, or things like that as much as maybe somebody may not like the business if they come in and they meet all the criteria that's what we as a planning commission look at we have to look at the criteria and so i just want you know somebody out there that may look at this say why would you do that that we're supporting the business we are in no way no matter how this vote goes either supporting or not supporting a business we're looking at legally do do they have the right have they met all the criteria i just want to make that clear Thanks, Steve. Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised we don't have such a business in Rapid City right now. Um, and I support the business. I think it's a good service for the community. <laughs> but, you know, my, my question is for Seth, and it's kind of um, if, you know, this, this business can't be within so many feet of child care centers and things like that. So if someone uh, rented a nearby um, you know, unit and wanted to put a child care center in there and then came to us for a conditional use permit, um, would the ch incoming child care center or whatever it happens to be supersede this and this company has to move or how would that work? Mr. Chair, when we're looking at a child care center, we do look to see how close they are to these kinds of businesses and on-sale liquor and any other um, use that might generate traffic or some other danger to children. And so um, the existing use is not in jeopardy of having to move. It's whether or not the new use is appropriate for the existing neighborhood. Good question. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Karen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wholeheartedly agree with Steve. I, if you were on the city council, you'd have maybe more leeway to say yes or no. Um, and I know in the past we have done that. But for us as a planning commission, we really have to look at the facts. And 
I think if this wasn't what it is, it would probably be on the consent calendar because it meets all the criteria, if I'm not mistaken. And, and so it's something that I do not support as a business, but um, from, from a planning standpoint, they couldn't have found a better spot. There's nothing around there that, you know, no residences, no childcare things. It, it's, a, it's the right spot to put it in. Um, so I guess I have to support it. Um, I do have a question, though. You know, they give the hours of what they want to do, and, and I'm assuming with uh, this approval, if we approve it, that it meets those same hours that they have, <clears throat> 9 to 11, Monday through Saturday, and Sundays from 10 to 10? Yes. Uh, stipulation number three states that it, they'll operate in compliance with their submitted operations plan, so that includes that hours of operation. Right. Is there a way that we can at least change some of the hours. And the only reason I'm saying anything is because at least on Sundays, it seems like you should at least not start till noon or something. That's just my personal feeling, so. Commissioner, I'm David Elias, and I'm the president of Dick and James and Artie Spot. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything specifically uh, that you have. You know, regarding the hours, you know, we had to submit a plan that listed generally what we we're going to do. And uh, we have a location right now in Sturgis, South Dakota that we operate. Uh, we open at 11 o'clock there, and we probably will follow that same pattern here. We were just required as part of the application process to specify an operation plan. So we kind of just put in <coughs> a broad uh, set of hours that we may even see us uh, in Oops, excuse me, I'm sorry. In Sturgis, we close at 8 p.m. on Sundays, so that we may even shorten those hours in, you know, as business dictates uh, those needs. Um, obviously, we won't extend them beyond the permitted uh, application hours. Um, you know, strangely enough, I think there's some people that are, you know, dropping people off at the front door of the church and sneaking over and getting their goods uh, between 10 and 11. Um, during the rally, obviously, we're very busy on Sunday mornings. Um, you know, we know that it's uh, controversial, and we respect that. Um, but uh, like I said, I, the hours aren't hard set in stone, so they may come a little bit later on. I can tell you generally what's happened in commissions and, and city councils throughout the country trying to uh, regulate time, place, and manner, specifically time, um, you get into challenges because as a tenant who's paying rent on a space, I really am entitled to generate revenue from that space 24 hours a day. Um, South Dakota has a statute, uh, SDCL 11-12, that regulates uh, adult businesses uh, to operate between uh, 8 a.m. Yeah, 8 a.m. and 2 a.m. seven days a week. Um, so by state statute, those are the you know, recommended hours. Um, we choose not to do that. Just the, the traffic patterns aren't there to justify the cost of operating at two o'clock in the morning, um, so we have no desire to do that. Um, you know, we base all of our decisions on business need. Thank you. I I would hope that you'd respect some of the things and and not open so early on at least Sunday, and that's just my my comment. Um, if somebody in the um, community would like to uh, appeal this decision if we do approve it, uh, then it would go to city council, and that's correct, Fletcher, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike? Um, I have this kind of like the signage uh, where we have an entry corridor, even though this is not necessarily designated an entry corridor, it is an entry into the city, and I, it would be all the, I understand that we don't have a lot of say, we got to go by what the law, uh, it'd be nice if it were on the other side of the, not, not the entry into, and I think it sets up a precedence of what can and can't. Um, I will have to probably vote for it. I, I wished I probably didn't have to, but. Um, because it does meet all the stipulations, I don't know that we have a choice. Thanks, Mike. Kurt? 
Uh, Rachel brought up a pretty good question, and I, I didn't understand totally the answer. Um, if you know, this will probably get approved, um, but I'm looking at the impact later on. Now, does that mean that a daycare or a church, or you know, any of the restricted uses within a thousand feet cannot be put in these areas after this? So. What if somebody wants a daycare within 500 feet of it after this is there? Do we deny the daycare? Vicki? There have been instances where we have had daycares that come in uh, adjacent to a use that we wouldn't want to see them next to. And those are existing uses. And we have cited that as uh, inappropriate for um, the mix of those uses. and. In those at those times we would see us make a recommendation to deny okay all right thank you I have a light up from Kinsley Groot that's what know. mine uh, says <laughs> all right. Carla. we need to change that because she sat in on one Planning Commission meeting and it, her name got changed and I'm here all the time um, I just had two comments um, our uh, in addition to a conditional use permit, we also require a license of these sorts of establishments. Um, the hours that are provided under um, adult-oriented business under the ordinance is from 8 a.m. to 2 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. So I thought I would give you that information. And then just related to the questions about businesses that come in after this um, establishment were to be there, um, I think that the, um, it, it, I think that I agree with what's been said, that it wouldn't compromise the business that was there first, and I think that any um, daycare center or church or, or anything like that would be coming in to the area with an awareness of the existence of the adult-oriented business. So um, I think that the 1,000-foot buffer zone is really for ones that were there first, and um, but. And, and to protect the, you know, the operation that they had there um, prior to the adult-oriented business coming in. But you know, we would have to look at if there's a daycare center that wants to go in in the same area and, and is comfortable with the, the use, obviously, if that's what they are pursuing, then that would be something we'd have to evaluate at that time. Thank you. Uh, Mike Collar. I'm curious as to how the uh, the little karate academy around the corner relates. Is that a is that considered a school or is that a business or how does that relate? Couldn't tell you, Vicky. Hope you can. <laughs> so that would not be what we would consider a school. That is a sports activity, um, and many of those, whether it be a fitness gym or a karate class, are open to individuals of all ages. Uh, so it would not fall within that description of what we would look at for a school, but a wonderful question. Thank you uh, Steve you know that questions come up before about what is the school moves in or whatever we've had this happen on East North Street We have a place there and the Try to park above one to build in and it's a way of somebody trying to push out a little bit It's like okay well, if I move with them with a thousand feet I can get rid of this and that's probably why you you have that law, so if, if he's legally done everything, put his money into there, and somebody decides, hey, I want you out, I'm gonna put a, a daycare right there, and it, it pushes somebody out, just put their, their hard earned money there. That's why you, you, you see that, and Rhapsody has had that happen before where they've tried to do that, so uh, there's a good reasoning why you have that. Thanks, Steve. Rachel? Uh, this is a question for the applicants. Um, and, and maybe for staff as well. I'm not aware of the uh, what's required for such a business in terms of um, making sure that people on the outside can't see what's on the inside. And I'm sure there's something in place for that. So I'm just curious if you could, if someone could answer uh, what kind of, you know, shading or, or, or whatnot. I can. I'm sure Fletcher could as well. Um, Rapid City in their ordinance specifies that the windows need to be covered with an opaque covering. Um, if there's any graphics or uh, textual uh, anything, they can't include any pictures of any merchandise, any uh, inappropriate images of any sort, any nudity, any of that kind of thing. Um, 
you know, generally what you see us do in, in our Sturgis store, I've operated stores in Sioux Falls as well in the past, we really cater to and try and uh, keep it a, a very first class uh, operation. And, and by saying that, I mean we, you know, use contemporary colors that match the landscaping of the build or the uh, architecture of the building. We try to, uh, matter of fact, I met with a landlord yesterday and I uh, had entertained the idea of instead of using the Dick and Jane's Naughty Spot uh, signage that you saw in your proposals, we're thinking about maybe tweaking it to just Dick and Jane's or Dick and Jane's Super Spot or something other than Naughty Spot um, just to kind of appease the landlord and some of the tenants in the building that are a little bit uh, unsure of how things are going. So, you know, we do um, take great strides in making sure that we're good, you know, corporate citizens and uh, good, you know, people, basically. Uh, you know, we regulate the stores very, very closely uh, as far as, you know, our staffing and our training and all those types of things. And we police the parking lots to make sure we don't have loitering and we monitor calls for service versus actual service and things like that. So, um, I don't know if that addresses your issue, but yeah, they are, they are covered and they're generally it's just a solid graphic or some sort of a colorful graphic and then they may have a, a textual center across the center that would say, you know, lingerie, lotions and oils, uh, shoes, um, you know, descriptive terms that would describe some of the items that you might find in there that would give the average person enough information to figure out that what's going on there. We don't need to you know, have obscene images or uh, offensive wording on the building to get our point across. Okay, um, so kids coming to, you know, uh, take karate lessons probably aren't gonna see anything. They, um, they can't see him. And, and I really appreciate hearing that you're working with the landlord and that the landlord themselves, you know, they've got um, probably the biggest uh, concern here about you know, dropping property values. And, and the fact that you're working with them, I think, tells me that we probably don't have to worry about that concern either. So, but thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. You're welcome. Karen? Yeah, my question, not question, I guess. My comment is, um, if for some reason uh, the gentleman and, and his business do not abide by uh, the rules that we've set through, forth through the conditional use permit, we do have the opportunity to revoke that, um, but I don't know exactly how that transpires. Does somebody from the uh, community say that, or do we notice that, or how does that work? Vicki? So typically it's going to be someone that's within the area that would notice something that's not in compliance with the approved conditions and per the ordinance. That would then get turned over to code enforcement. Code enforcement would investigate if they determined that there was a violation, then they would be put on notice and proceed as with any other code violation on any other property. So they'd have an opportunity to rectify whatever was wrong? And Correct. Okay, thank you. If I might add to that as well, Ms. Schmidt, the ordinance specifies that we're, as business owners or operators of uh, adult-oriented business, we're required to allow the Rapid City Police Department and any other you know, uh, inspecting type officials to pay periodic visits um, and we're happy to do that. We, they did it in Sturgis the first week or two that we were open and then I think they got bored and had better things to do. But the, uh, you know, we're absolutely, you know, more than welcoming to anyone, any one of you, any one of the city council, any one of the police department that wants to come in. We're not doing anything that's, you know, illegal or uh, outside of the regulations. Thank you, John Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I hope you give me leeway just to speak again. I, I don't want to be taking all your time, but Karen alluded to something a little earlier that the city council has a lot of latitude on what we do, and we absolutely do. I mean, more than likely this will be appealed because it's controversial, um, no matter what you do. Um, but, you know, we ultimately, as a city council, are bound by the law. And I have been on the council long enough now to see a few things get denied that shouldn't have been denied because of the fact that they do fall under the ordinance and we lose them in court. So ultimately, that's why we have zoning laws. 
And ultimately, on this one, I believe it was 2012 or 13 that we upgraded the ordinance on this, and we did tighten it quite a bit compared to what it used to be. So, but, you know, the owner, when he comes in, I'm sure he'll follow his business plan just the way that it's stipulated in here. And if he doesn't, we as a community have the opportunity to have them removed. And this has been done. We did this not too long ago in my ward with a business that was not being followed as far as their business plan. So, you know, the citizens ultimately do have a say in it. The, the property owner, as long as he's following the zoning regulations and his business plan, has the right to run his business. And, you know, the thing that gets iffy about this is our morals. But our morals have nothing to do with the law. The law ultimately supersedes that. So I know that there's people that have an issue voting this and putting this through, but ultimately we as a planning commission and we as a council have to follow the law and our zoning laws. And if we don't agree with it, then we have to find ways to change it. So thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Mike? I would like to just kind of put a little addition on to that. Sometimes in order to change the law, you have to approach it and make sure that you address the problems with the law. And uh, so sometimes when we deny, even though the law says, it's to an attempt to change so and make things proper. Thanks, Mike. I don't have any more lights up. I'd look for a motion. Actually, uh, Chairman, if I might, uh, just to follow up on Mike's uh, statement, uh, when we opened our business in uh, Lincoln County, South Dakota, Olivia's Adult Super Center, you know, they did not have any regulation on the books at all. Um, so it basically gave us a blank slate to do pretty much anything we wanted to. Um, you know, we have subsequently, and I've separated from that business now, but it, at the time, you know, we approached Tom Woolman, the state's attorney there, and Mike Nodowski and, and the team over there, and our lawyers, myself, their team, you know, sat down collectively and came up with, you know, a really good set of ordinances that were solid that Lincoln County has now put in place and put in a conditional use process. And if, you know, there's ever a need in Rapid City that you guys want to revisit uh, how these things are regulated, you know, we're always willing to participate in the conversation and, and uh, offer the viewpoint of, you know, the business, uh, if that helps you make decisions. Thank you. Uh, motion? Move to approve the stipulation. Second. Galen made the motion to approve uh, with the staff stipulations. Uh, we'll give the second to Rachel. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Discussion items, staff items, anything today? Thank you. Look for a motion to adjourn. Aye. Steve. Steve. Sorry. Last time we had a meeting, I brought up the question about the Frisbee golf course, and staff was going to get back to me on that. Mr. Chair, I did request information from our parks director, and I have not heard back from him, but I'll follow up on that again. Because I still can't play Frisbee golf over there. I'm getting really irritated. <laughs> I'll let Jeff know. Karen made the motion to adjourn. Mike uh, Kwasney seconded that motion. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. aye.